March 2009, the city of Tracy in California. Home to Sandra Cantu, who had just turned eight years old. She lived with her mother Maria and her three older siblings, Miranda, Simone and Thomas. Maria and Sandra's dad Daniel had been separated for a long time. He lived quite far out but the kids still spoke to him on the phone most days and had a good relationship with him. Her brother Thomas said Sandra never stopped moving, her energy was endless. She loved helping her mother with the baking and her grandparents with the gardening. She enjoyed gymnastics and dancing and more often than not you could find her outside playing. She had no problem knocking on doors and introducing herself to make new friends, but even if no one could come out to play, she was more than happy to make up her own games and entertain herself. Thomas said she was so young and still had a real innocence to her, never letting things bother her and moving on quickly if she ever felt sad. Although school for some children can be a big transition and quite a scary change, Sandra couldn't get there quick enough in the mornings and would bounce home every day ready to tell everybody what she had done. Thomas said she was, put simply, a carefree, playful and happy young girl. March 27th, 2009 was just your typical working and school day for everyone in Tracy. Just after 2pm, Sandra was back at home and ready to fill everybody in on her day. She put her bag inside and then ran back out as she saw her brother coming home too. The family lived in the Orchard Estates mobile home park, home to about 100 people, right next to a little park. The ever-energetic eight-year-old wasn't one to just sit indoors. She wanted to be out playing with her friends before dinner. All the neighbouring children were out a lot, so Maria was happy to let her play and call her back in when dinner was ready, the same as she did almost every day. Thomas said Sandra was going through a big Hello Kitty phase and she changed into her favourite Hello Kitty top and some black leggings before hugging her mother and running outside. A few hours later, Maria asked Thomas to shout his sisters in for food. Miranda, who was playing nearby, came over right away, but Sandra didn't. It was now getting darker and thinking she was playing a game, maybe hide and seek. He searched for about another 20 minutes or so, but she was nowhere. Maria and Simone got into the car and drove around asking the neighbours, but no one had seen her in hours. At 7.30pm, Maria called 911, and this was now a missing persons case. Uh, well, I have a missing daughter. Okay, how old is she? She's eight. When's the last time you saw her? Oh, you know, she's at three. She told me she was going over to this one girl's place, and she hasn't been home. And I went looking all over. This was already considered very serious because of her age, and detectives quickly brought in dogs to smell Sandra's clothes and see if they could obtain a scent outside. The police dogs led officers straight out of the park and onto the main road, but after this, the trail went cold. Detectives in the park took a picture of Sandra door to door, but no photo was needed. Absolutely everyone knew who she was, and as worried as they all were that she was missing, no one had any information. For a missing eight year old Tracy girl, it continues this morning. Investigators say Sandra Cantu walked away from her home at the Orchard Estates Mobile Home Park in Tracy. KCRA 3 Sherry Kane Shams live in Tracy, where the search continues right now. Well, good morning. Behind me is the Orchard Estates Mobile Home Park. You can see Tracy police are stationed out here, and we've watched this morning as they've stopped and questioned people driving out of the mobile home park to get their day started today. Now, this is part of the police investigation unfolding in front of us. There's also what the volunteers are doing, and there's been an emotional search for the little girl. 
and I wish we didn't have to be here, and I wish she was at home with her family, and I hope if somebody has her, they bring her home. She needs to be home with her family and her friends and all these people that care, because we all care. That's why we're all here. And that's the voice of just one of some estimated 300 volunteers looking for the girl over the weekend. Eight-year-old Sandra Cantu is Hispanic, four feet tall, and weighs 45 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. So, so far, what we know from that surveillance tape is that it shows little Sandra Cantu leaving the mobile home park about 4 p.m. and then returning and then walking away again. So the question, where did she walk to that last time that she was being seen? on that tape and where is she today is what everybody would like to know the investigation out here continues police say if you know anything you're urged to contact tracy police one agent said that the amount of people living in the park who had very serious past convictions was alarmingly quite a lot everyone from sex offenders living close to sandra to an ice cream truck driver that the neighbors found so creepy with their children they had taken to chasing him off when he came by while they got to work asking questions, Sandra's grandfather Joe said they could have a look at his cameras, which he had only very recently installed after a break-in. His cameras showed Sandra leaving the house just as Maria had said, heading off to play. She soon came back skipping across the road, seeming happy, and it looked as if she was heading back to her house. But instead of going up the steps, she turned around and started walking off down the street, which was heading for one of the exits. There was no more footage of her on the tapes. She did not once come back into view. She had to have left the park, but she knew not to go out unless it was with her family or a trusted adult. So seeing her head that way made police think something or someone she knew had caught her attention. Sandra hadn't physically seen her father Daniel in a long time, and police learned that he and Maria were involved in a financial dispute linked to custody, but Maria assured detectives that he would never have anything to do with this. Despite their issues as exes, he still had a great relationship with Sandra, and she adored him. The media were focused quite heavily on Daniel, and everyone was scrambling to get an interview with him. Tell us a little bit about what we were reporting today, Kyle, this guy Kyle saying that you had gone to Mexico. Speak to that. What would you like me to say about it? The, Obviously, you're not in Mexico. I'm right here in front of me. All I know is I received a call from my sister stating that uh, my daughter was missing Friday, and this was on a Saturday. I rushed out here. I stood for a day, and I needed to get back for my job. And I think the reason why it's important for us to do this interview is because if the attention is taken off of you, then the attention can be put on the real person, if there is a person that abducted Sandra or the search, instead of these uh, these things that are kind of thwarting it's, people. It's like I told the detective, do everything you need to do to do your job to the best of your ability. So, you know, do your job, do the best thing you can do. Thank you for all your prayers. I love you. If you can get to a phone, now 911, babe. Call somebody, run, do anything you can do. Or please try and get home. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Daniel lived way out of town, and his colleagues could account for him working over that weekend. Detectives were happy that he had nothing to do with his daughter's disappearance. 48 hours later, and investigators had now had over 700 leads to follow. They said to their relief, none of them indicated Sandra was dead. Young girls matching her description had been seen all over the place. We've had sightings from people all over California saying they've seen her, which would definitely suggest that she is still alive. Statistics show that she's probably still in Tracy, but if we get a tip in Nevada or in Southern California, wherever we get a tip, we are going to go, one officer said. but time was ticking by and the local authorities needed more resources. They enlisted the help of CARD, which stands for Child Abduction Rapid Deployment, and this team is part of the FBI. The first few hours of a child going missing is absolutely crucial, but no one knew how long she had actually been missing for. There had been several hours that had passed since she left her trailer, and it was impossible to determine whether she had gone missing the second she left or whether she had been out playing for hours when something happened. 
Special Agent Joseph Bryan was leading the card team, and he said that statistically speaking, after this length of time, a staggering and heartbreaking 97% of abducted children have already been murdered. But until you find a body, you're focused on that 3%. There were now over 200 officers from various agencies across the country involved. Until that point, in Northern California, there had only been one other missing person search as big as this one. The head of Tracy PD said she had to order people to go home and sleep. Every second of every day they were out, scared that in the hours they slept, they would miss something. As they entered into the following week, the community gathered together for a vigil. Thomas said he knew the outcome of this mystery was not going to be positive. Something terrible had happened to his sister, no matter how hopeful they were trying to be, and the vigil was more about feeding this grief together and being there for Maria. At 8.30pm, the investigators, who were also in attendance, were suddenly caught off guard. A neighbour, Melissa, ran over to them, so hysterical she could barely breathe. She only lived a few trailers down from Sandra's family and had found a handwritten note on the ground, right by one of the mailboxes. So disturbed by what it said, she had dropped it and ran straight over to the officers. It read, Cantu locked in stolen suitcase, thrown in water on Bacchetti Road and Whitehall Road. Witness. Melissa was right to be disturbed. The implication of this was very sinister, but the note was odd. It looked like there were very deliberate spelling mistakes that had been made to try and cover up who wrote it. Despite this being the first piece of evidence they had found, something did feel a little strange. There was a strong breeze that night. Almost everyone was at the vigil and accounted for, and with officers going up and down the streets for days, it was weird that this had only just turned up in the location it had. Had someone carefully chosen their timing, knowing that everyone was at the vigil and planted it there just minutes before. Was the note fake? Who wrote it? There were so many questions. But firstly, they needed Melissa to come in and give a statement, and the FBI handled her interview. As well as being a neighbour, Melissa worked as a Sunday school teacher in her granddad's church, where he was the local pastor. Having gone through a divorce a few years ago and now a recent breakup, she was living with her grandparents and her five-year-old daughter, and Sandra and her sisters would often go to her trailer to play with her daughter. Although Sandra didn't go to the church, she and her siblings knew Melissa well. She had become a good friend of the family. Melissa said she hadn't really looked around to see if anyone was nearby when she found the note, or if there was anything else suspicious. They asked if they could take a look at her car, and she agreed. In the glove box, they found a post-it note, with a few words written on it which had been scribbled over. As a precaution, police sent this to experts, but were happy to let her go and focus on the note. Melissa did, however, give them a list of potential suspects to look at. The first person was a man living in the park that she said had a history of drugging children. Another had been seen kissing Sandra on the lips and touching her hair. And then there were two other people, a father and son that Melissa said had pictures of young girls in their phones, including some of Sandra on one of their laps. All of them were happy to come in for questioning. The man that had kissed Sandra, to their shock, admitted that he was attracted to young girls, but called it a harmless affection, and said he had nothing to do with Sandra being missing. They did find pictures of children on the father and son's phones, which were definitely concerning and questionable, given that they had no relationship to any of them, but they too were adamant they knew nothing. Three of them said they were even happy to undergo polygraph tests, something which is not admissible and could never be used in court, but they wanted to prove in any way they could that they weren't involved. One of the men, the same man who had admitted to kissing Sandra, passed the polygraph and showed no signs of deception, whereas the other men failed. They definitely wanted to keep their eyes on all of them, as they now had concerns that went even further than Sandra, but there was just not enough there to charge anyone and this was the case they had to give all their attention to at the minute. 
It's been a week since eight-year-old Sandra Cantu left home to play in California and never returned. Authorities in Tracy are tracking down hundreds of leads this morning and raising the reward for information on the girl. Investigators are sifting through trash in the local landfill, searching nearby rivers and reviewing surveillance video in hopes of finding eight-year-old Sandra Cantu. They questioned me about a bunch of things. Police have questioned Sandra's father, but Daniel Cantu, who's returned from Mexico, says he hasn't seen her in a year and is willing to take a lie detector test. I could care less about Yes, I, I, I have no problems with any of it. They've also spoken with this man, Frank Wohler, a neighbor who admits he kissed the second grader on the lips two years ago. Impulse is just being friendly. I do some of my students also. FBI agents and Tracy police have searched nearby homes and towed vehicles to test for evidence. So the quality of leads that have come in have led investigators to be pretty upbeat that we're going to have a conclusion of this case here shortly. Sandra's image is everywhere in this small community. <laughs> Residents continue nightly vigils, hoping their thoughts and prayers are answered soon. Hattie Kaufman, CBS News, Los Angeles. They wanted to talk to Melissa some more. She clearly had a lot of information about people in the park, and she was still the only person to have come forward with anything. From talking to neighbours, the general consensus was that Melissa would often insert herself into things or make things up to get people to talk to her and feel sorry for her. She loved being the centre of attention, and detectives wondered if this was what her behaviour was down to, or was she actually a genuine witness and just acting oddly. They found that Melissa had bipolar disorder, anxiety, depression and post-traumatic stress disorder and she did have a past with the law. She had a habit of stealing and on several occasions pleaded no contest to charges or being jailed. She was also a person of interest in a few arson cases but had left town before anything came of them. She had filed for bankruptcy in 2003, reporting credit card and medical debt and was still paying it off through her teaching wages. When they tried to get hold of her again to talk some more, they found out she had checked herself into hospital for swallowing a razor blade, something she later claimed was because she was sleepwalking and despite the fact she was doing okay, she didn't want to be interviewed. Police headed out with a search and rescue team to the location on the note. The directions led them to an irrigation pond, which was where a lot of drains linked to and where sewage and the likes would go. The pond was about 150 yards long and 30 yards wide. The smell and conditions were so bad, there wasn't a chance they would be able to get anything down to the bottom or even see anything. It was thick with all kinds of substances. You couldn't see your own hand in front of you, and it just wasn't safe. But there was nothing floating on the top and nothing on the grass nearby. Unless something did rise to the surface, it was unlikely they would be able to find out what, if anything, was actually there. It had now been an agonising 10 days of searching for Sandra, and this missing persons case would soon become a very different investigation. Detectives had been monitoring the irrigation pond, and one morning while a worker was starting to drain the pond, a black suitcase floated to the top and was now stuck in the mud on the bank. There was a lock on the case which had been secured even further with a cord. Great lengths had been gone to to make opening this up as difficult as possible. Pulling it out, they could tell from the weight of it that everyone's worst fears were probably about to be confirmed. Sandra Cantu's body was found in the fetal position inside the suitcase. She was still wearing her black leggings and her Hello Kitty shirt. She had cuts to her body and they found a piece of torn cloth tied around her head. It was soaked in blood and knotted into a noose. An autopsy would show that her cause of death was strangulation likely using the noose. She had been drugged using alprazolam and had been sexually assaulted, but there was no presence of foreign DNA found. They determined that she had been sexually assaulted by an unknown object and had been killed only a couple of hours after she was seen on camera. The search for a little girl missing in California is now a hunt for a killer. The body of eight-year-old Sandra Cantu was found hidden not far from her hometown. Ever since she disappeared, volunteers in Tracy had been determined to find her. Now, the city's police chief is determined to find her killer. We will be determining the person or persons responsible for this reprehensible act, and we will bring them to justice. 
On the 10th day of searching for Sandra, investigators were called to an irrigation pond about two miles from the girl's home. Farm workers draining the pond had found something suspicious. As the water began to flow, a, uh, an object floated to the surface. Uh, they identified it as a black container. Inside the bag, we located the body of Sandra Cantu. The search for the second grader had been intense, with every passing day getting harder for her mother. How are you holding up? Not very good. I miss my baby. I miss my little girl. The eight-year-old girl that everybody in the community knew, the same one that knocked on their doors most days to ask if their children would come out to play, the same girl they invited in for dinner and treated like one of their own, was gone. Given the sexual assault, the police quickly built a profile of who their potential suspect would be. A white male, aged 25 to 40, a criminal past which would include sexual assault or possessing child abuse material. He would be someone who was known to Sandra and someone she trusted. Likely a neighbour living in the park or someone that knew another person within the park. This was not a random kidnap. Sandra knew her killer. The registered sex offenders in the area all had their alibis checked and all of them could be accounted for. The neighbours near the pond were questioned and one of them had seen something that stood out to him, although he didn't realise it at the time. He lived right near the ditch and said he had seen a dark purple two-toned SUV driving around on the Friday that Sandra went missing. The car was a distinctive colour and it didn't belong to any of the neighbours. And, for obvious reasons, it was a strange place to be parked up. Most people kept away from the swampy area. He thought it was so odd, in fact, he actually decided to approach the car to see if he knew the driver, but the car was empty. As he stood looking around, a woman suddenly came running out from the trees, saying she had to pull over to go to the toilet. She got back into the car and quickly sped away. The description he gave matched none other than Melissa Huckabee, and CCTV confirmed she drove the same car. Going back to look at the cameras, Melissa had gotten into her SUV from the parking spot, just opposite Sandra's house, at about 3.30pm, and drove it back towards her house, which was to the left of where Sandra lived. She then headed to her grandparents' church, before being spotted by the resident at the pond, at about 5.30pm. Despite the fact she was still in the hospital and they had been letting her rest, they were no longer talking to her as a potential witness, or even a person of interest they were now looking at her as a suspect. They marched in ready to get to the bottom of her stories, but she insisted she was none the wiser about what had happened, and all she had done was bring the note to their attention. At 4pm when Sandra had last been seen, Melissa told police that she had been at her church decorating her classroom and hadn't seen anything around that area. Naturally, they asked if she could prove that's where she was, and phone records could provide this. She had actually made her own call to the police to report that her suitcase had been stolen from her driveway. She said that when she heard Sandra was missing, she had even sent a text message to Maria saying, tell the police I had something stolen today around 4pm. I don't know if that makes a difference or not. The suitcase Sandra was found in was the exact colour and model Melissa reported missing, a black Eddie Bauer suitcase. And the note she allegedly found didn't just say suitcase, it said, stolen suitcase. Now there's improbable, and then there's impossible. And what Melissa was implying happened would mean that the person that had kidnapped and killed Sandra also happened to find her suitcase on her drive, decided to use that to conceal Sandra, and do all of this without being seen or heard by anyone in broad daylight. And then Melissa was the one who happened to find the note. Detectives decided they had to wiretap her phone, and two days after she was released from the hospital, they heard a call. Melissa called Maria to invite Sandra's sister Miranda over for a sleepover. Miranda did spend the night and told Maria she thought it was strange that Melissa only mentioned Sandra's disappearance once and seemed more interested in what evidence they had found. Their case against Melissa was building, but it was still all circumstantial. Another neighbour came forward and shared a story with officers. 
They said a short while before Sandra went missing, Melissa had taken one of the neighbouring children to the park for a couple of hours without getting her parents' permission. When the seven-year-old returned home, she was slurring her words, not making any sense, and could barely walk. Her parents rushed her to the hospital and found that she had been drugged with benzodiazepines, exactly the same as what they found in Sandra's system. Melissa denied drugging her and no charges were filed. With so many fingers now pointing at Melissa, she spoke to a reporter to try and clear her name. So do you believe your missing suitcase was the same suitcase that Sandra was found in? Um, I do not know. From what I can see on TV, it does not look like my suitcase. Uh, the police have not uh, closed any information as to whether or not it is my suitcase. There was a situation where you and, a, and your daughter were out with another kid, and then what happened there? There was a, someone accused you of something? Oh, um, I had taken my daughter and one of her friends um, to the park, which I, which I had done for the third time that week. Um, the mother was, um, I guess, at work, and the grandmother had told uh, the little girl that she could uh, go to the park, which she does all the time. And uh, when the mother came home, she didn't know where she was. Um, I'd given the mother my phone number, um, used my cell phone number in case of anything will happen. Um, everything was fine. I brought her back. Uh, police were called out at the time, and I was then called by my grandparents because uh, her mother did not know that she was in a team. I mean, that she was with me. Hearing the story about the drugs, police finally got a warrant to search her trailer and her granddad's church. Inside the trailer, they discovered a notebook which matched the note Melissa had found on the ground. Other writing inside the book was so distinctive, it matched the writing on the note perfectly. The experts examining the post-it note found in her glove box also came back with something pretty damning. The words that were written on the note were Bacchetti Road, Whitehall Road, Water. They also found Alprazolam, which had been prescribed to Melissa, exactly what was found in Sandra's system. Inside the church, they found a rolling pin with a bent handle and a bloody smudge on it, blood which would later turn out to contain Sandra's DNA. This was what she had been sexually assaulted with. They also discovered one of the blinds was missing part of its draw cord, which the FBI experts determined to be consistent with the cord used to seal the suitcase shut. On April 10th, Melissa was brought in for another interview. Her story was the same, but detectives now had so much evidence, and they wanted the truth out of her. When she was confronted with everything they had, she broke down and started crying hysterically. Between 5.30 and 5.40, two people saw your car stopped on Whitehall Road. They saw you come from out of the bushes on Whitehall Road, and someone asked you what? <laughs> when I was, I was okay, and I said I was going to the middle room. Mm-hmm. What were you doing, Melissa? <laughs> Through muffled tears she said it was an accident I can't live with myself, I deserve to just die I didn't mean for it to happen, she just died It was an accident I told you it was an accident, I know it was Accidents happen I went to church, I was there And when I came outside I went to take it out and it was heavy. She was in there. She wasn't breathing or anything. What did she look like? She looked pale. <laughs> and I killed her. Huh? I thought that she was dead. And I panicked. So what happened? I tried to wake her up and she wouldn't wake up. And I didn't know what else. 
to do. She told the police that Sandra had spotted her getting into her car near her house, which was why she turned around in the road. She came up to the car to say hi, and then saw the suitcase in the back of her vehicle. Melissa said that Sandra had, without her knowing or seeing, got into the suitcase playing hide and seek, and she must have suffocated. It was only when she drove to the church and lifted the suitcase out of the car that she realised she was in there. She said she tried to give CPR but realised it was too late, and in a panic, tried to hide her body in the ditch. Detectives said they just let her talk, digging herself into more holes as she did so. They already knew the way she was found in the suitcase was not a position she could have got into by herself. Sandra had also been drugged and sexually assaulted and it could only be Melissa behind this. This was no accident. It was a story so convoluted and calculated, the minute she stopped talking, they placed her in handcuffs. Melissa Huckabee was charged with the kidnap, sexual assault and murder of Sandra Cantu. She was also later charged with drugging the other seven-year-old and her 37-year-old ex-boyfriend. Sandra trusted her completely. She wouldn't have thought twice about going over to Melissa if she had called her towards the car. Police believed that Melissa coaxed Sandra into the car, likely on the premise of coming to help her decorate the church, and Sandra had no issue doing this. Melissa then drove her to her grandfather's nearby church, drugged her to the point where she would have either fallen unconscious or been totally unable to fight back sexually assaulted her with the rolling pin, strangled her to death, and then stuffed her into the suitcase. By the time people were looking for Sandra, Melissa made the call to police about the suitcase, texted Maria, wrote the note, and attempted to stage being the hero. And we have this story tonight. Accused child killer Melissa Huckabee returns to court on Thursday in Stockton. Huckabee, meanwhile, sits in the San Joaquin County Jail. And jail records show that she has been showing some strange behavior of late. 28-year-old Melissa Huckabee is charged with kidnapping, rape, and the killing of 8-year-old Sandra Cantu. Her strange behavior in August prompted four different incident reports in jail. Among them are on August 12th. A custody officer writes, I found Huckabee laying on the floor next to her bed. She stated that she felt dizzy and passed out. A half hour later, an officer noted, I saw Huckabee sitting next to her bed with a trash can. When I asked her what was wrong, she replied, I took pills. Three days later, a report read, inmate Huckabee was hiding behind mattress with a blanket around her neck to safety cell per psych. And later, she refused dinner. Because there is a gag order in place, no one is commenting on the incidents. And that same gag order has kept the autopsy report sealed, which keeps secret the cause of Sandra Cantu's death. Gag orders and grand jury indictments have become more frequent tools in San Joaquin County. Over the last eight months, the district attorney has gone to the grand jury four times for indictments, and the court has issued gag orders in three of those cases. The defense's latest motion was to file for more evidence to be turned over, but so far has not put in motion to move the trial out of the county. Yet that looms as a likely possibility. The district attorney's office may announce soon as to whether or not it will seek the death penalty. Now Huckabee is expected to enter a plea on Thursday and the judge could set a trial date as well. Melissa pleaded not guilty and her legal team were focused heavily on the fact that she had just been diagnosed with manic depression and schizophrenia and was clearly not well. They said that when she was 19, she was raped by a police officer, which had caused a build-up of trauma, something which she never wanted to seek treatment for, and never spoke about. She attempted to hurt herself in prison too, and would often show up to her arraignments with cuts on her body. She was soon placed on suicide watch. Melissa's own parents said they were baffled, and couldn't believe their daughter was at the centre of this. They had never seen any signs of her even showing anger. Her friends agreed. They said she was a great mother, a lovely neighbour, friendly and kind to everyone. Her mother Judy apologised to Maria in court and said, I felt your pain and I understand the anger you must have. From a mother to a mother, I'm so sorry. Each time that I sit in this courtroom, I place myself on your side and I felt your pain. If I could give you justice, the justice that you deserve, that would be to have your baby girl in your arms right now. When confronted with the vast amounts of evidence the prosecution were about to show, Melissa offered a partial confession and changed her plea to guilty of first-degree murder and kidnapping. 
As part of the agreement, the charges that she sexually assaulted and drugged Sandra were dropped. In pleading guilty, she avoided the death penalty and the charges of sexual assault, the drugging of Sandra as well as her ex-boyfriend and the other seven-year-old neighbouring girl were all dropped. It is not enough that I say I'm sorry, but that is all I can do. From the day Sandra has died, I've had to live with the consequences of what I've done. For the rest of my life, I'm going to have to live with these feelings. And I loved Sandra a great deal. She was sweet and as a little girl who did not deserve to have such a short life. I alone are responsible for Sandra's death. I would like to apologize directly to you, Maria, for all of the pain that I've caused. I should not have taken Sandra from you. And I want you to know that she did not suffer and I did not sexually molest your daughter. I would also like to apologize to my own daughter, whom I've lost. I hope that someday you will forgive me. I love you a great deal, and I hope to see you again someday soon. I owe an apology to the people of Tracy, and the police officers who spent so much time looking for Sandra. I know in my heart that God has forgiven me, and I know my family has forgiven me, and I'm asking you, Maria, for your forgiveness. I can't imagine forgiving somebody who would harm my own daughter, but I hope that someday you can forgive me. Maria, I wish I could give you an explanation for what happened. I owe you an explanation. But I still cannot understand why I did what I did. Every day, I try to discover my motivation, but I still do not have an answer. This is a question I will struggle with for the rest of my life. And I hope that this apology will help you in some way by accepting responsibility for what I have done. I hope that I can give you some peace. But the prosecution said given the trauma that Dr. O'Malley found in the instrument that was used, it's sadly to say hard for me to believe that Sandra Cantu did not suffer. Sandra's dad Daniel spoke to Melissa in court and gave a very emotional statement. You took the life of an innocent little girl and she didn't do nothing. She's not even old enough to decide to eat ice cream yet. And nothing changes and nothing's going to change the fact whether I cry. There ain't nothing you do in life ever going to change anything. Mr. Cantu, I need you to address your comments to me. Okay. She changed the lives of a lot of people. All I can say right now is repent and think about what you've done. I'm sorry. She was facing 25 years to life, but the judge gave her the maximum. To one of imprisonment in state prison for life without the possibility of parole. Melissa Huckabee was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. To this day, Melissa Huckabee has never fully admitted to what she did to Sandra, nor has she said why she did it. The district attorney said there were 20 or so times that Melissa cut herself, set fires, or verbally or psychologically attacked someone else, and there was something like that going on here after the murder, where she wanted to be the centre of attention. would have been murder victim Sandra Cantu's ninth birthday. Her family and friends gathered to remember her short life and to honor those who had tried to save her. KCRA 3's Damani Lewis is live for us in Tracy with more on this painful birthday observance. Uh, you can see there's a happy birthday balloon here on this tree as well as several flowers at the base of this tree that was dedicated to Sandra Cantu. People in attendance called the service a celebration of life for Sandra. <laughs> A fitting opening song. She's a beautiful girl. For a mother who has needed a family and community to lean on through difficult times. Yeah, there's a lot more people than what I thought. Overwhelmed by the amount of support, Maria Chavez, mother of eight-year-old Sandra Cantu, found herself engulfed by friends and strangers alike, all here in support of what would have been the ninth birthday of Tracy's Angel. For many here, they choose not 
to focus on the pain of the past. This is the celebration of life, absolutely. It's to go beyond the negativity that has happened and to keep the positive. That's where Sandra's strength is, is in this community. And every story shared of Sandra, a tear soon followed. But on this night, family members say they gained strength through the community. And comfort knowing Sandra is in a better place and her spirit free from harm. She was happy, she loved life. That Friday, Sandra skipped out of her house after a great day at school, ready to see her friends and enjoy her weekend. To think about what happened to her in that church is so awful, and the fact that it was at the hands of someone she and her family trusted and loved so much makes it even more sickening. Right outside her favourite place, her school, the community of Tracy created a special area in her memory. They planted a tree with pink blossoms, built a little sand volleyball court and a kid's playhouse called Sandra's Cottage. Her grandfather said he wanted it to become a family setting, something she would have loved to go to with her siblings and something that other children could come and enjoy and make new friends there. Neighbours said that Sandra was like the community's daughter. Everyone knew her so well and saw her as part of their own family. When she went missing, it was a sobering moment for everyone. One officer said, life is precious, and this little girl only had eight years, and that's it. Thomas said, she took one of the biggest parts of our lives away, the joy of watching someone blossoming into something they could have been. Time does heal some of it, but there's always things that will linger, and that's okay. That's what makes us human. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like to support our channel and help us to continue to make content, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. It helps us so much and we really appreciate it.